A tunable notch filter is shown here designed with two op amps. We want to see uh, why this is working like a notch filter and uh, if that is the case then we want to prove that the omega zero, uh, the center frequency of notch is one over r square root of c1 c2 as is shown here this is the plot of magnitude response uh, you, on y-axis you can see absolute value of v out over v in which is absolute value of transfer function for this circuit and on the x-axis you can see omega in radian per second uh, which is the frequency so okay let's start with the circuit I can do the intuitive analysis but that's at the end of this uh, computation if you're interested uh, at the end of this video I'm gonna just intuitively explain why this works like a notch filter basically at DC you have gain of one uh, and at super high frequency you have gain of one as well but at center frequency at some mid frequency omega naught you have notch okay but aside from intuitive analysis let's just compute it so compute the transfer function and find omega naught omega zero so consider assume that op amps are properly biased so it means the proper supply voltages are connected applied and then these two op amps are in linear region virtual short valid which means positive input terminal for each op amp is equal to its negative input terminal voltage wise and no current flows to input terminal because input terminals of both op amps uh, they have infinite impedance in linear region of operation so with that in mind let's just assume that this node here has a voltage vx since uh, nothing can flow through the op amp so the current is zero v positive is equal to vx so i am going to say that this node v positive is vx and therefore because of virtual short v negative is also vx which means the voltage on top of on the top terminal of c2 is vx now you can see that c2 has the same voltage uh, on both terminal as resistor r so effectively r and c2 are in parallel what i can say about r and c2 is this i can say because voltage of resistor r is equal to the voltage of cap c2 the voltage drop across them is the same so if there is a current i flowing like this and if the current i2 is flowing like this therefore in s domain i can say vr is r times i and vc2 is uh, impedance of cap 1 over c2s s domain times i2 so in summary i can just say i2 is r times c2s times i this is important let's keep this as equation number one I'm gonna write number one here okay great now let's uh, start uh, the same route so starting from Vn I am going to write a KVL downstream through 2R through C1 through R and then finally through the last R to the ground so writing a KVL let me change the color so I am writing a KVL and uh, it's Vn equal to okay the current i is going through 2r and then c1 remember that this ideal op amp in linear region no current flows through it so through the input positive terminal so whatever current i goes through 2r goes through c1 and then goes through r so we can say v in is equal to 2r plus uh, 1 over so impedance of that c1 cap is 1 over c1s by, by the way that cap as shown is a variable capacitor so we can change that to adjust the omega naught okay um, so 2r plus 1 over c1s plus r times i and then what we have is r times so the last r connected to ground times the sum of i plus i2 okay so what i'm going to do is now i'm going to substitute i2 using equation one so applying equation one I can write v in is equal to clean up you have 2r you have r you have another r so 4r plus 1 over c1s plus r and i2 is r c2s so become r square c2s times i um, so great what is the benefit of this well we managed to find v in very quickly 
as a function of i. Let me just highlight this. This is super helpful, and this is a shortcut method to find the answer to this for this question, basically transfer function. Now, this current 2R, this current I is passing the, through this resistor 2R. But the interesting thing is, uh, since we just said V plus is equal to V minus for op amp 1, so you can see that uh, this voltage here is the same as this voltage. At the same time, V in is a common voltage on the right side of 4R and 2R. So 4R and 2R, they are having same voltage drop across them. Since 4R is double 2R, therefore if I is passing through 2R, 0.5I can pass, should pass through 4R. Um, and... Uh, there is no current can go through the input terminal of ideal op amp because of infinite impedance. So that current 0.5i should continue going to the upper, 0.5, upper 4r as well. So 0.5i continue this way to the output. So another KVL that I write from V in to V out would be this KVL. V in minus V out is equal to uh, 4R resistor plus 4R resistor times 0.5I that is flowing through them. So effectively, um, I just concluded that um, I can write it here. So effectively, let me just write it here, equal to 4R times I. Okay, um, so one thing I can do is I can just continue this. Let's use... Uh, what we found in 2 and substitute i with that. So what I got effectively, I'm going to change the color so that we have better contrast. So we have continuing on what we saw, v in minus v out is equal to 4r and then i is as you can see from equation 2. So I, I am using result from equation 2. So maybe I put it this way, it's clear. Using equation number 2, I can say V out minus V in is equal to 4R substituting uh, I with what I found in equation 2 as a function of V in. So 4R in denominator plus 1 over C1S plus R square C2S divide by, and the whole thing times V in. Great. If you uh, reshuffle things around, simplify, so that then V out is defined as a function of VR, you can say V out S over V in S, which is effectively transfer function H of S, is equal to, uh, clearly is equal to, I'm going to just write the uh, final answer. So it will be uh, 1 plus um, R2, C1, C2, S squared, divide by uh, 1 plus 4R, C1, S, plus uh, R squared, C1, C2, S squared. That is the transfer function we found. That is very powerful. So we found the transfer function for this circuit, and uh, this is what we wanted to find look at this, the transfer function we have second order polynomial in numerator we can we have second order polynomial in numerator and we have second order polynomial in s in denominator so if you want to find uh, zeros of transfer function zero of uh, h of s you would say okay set the one plus r square c1 c2 s square equal to zero and if you do that, you find that S becomes equal to, effectively you have, from, from what we found here, S equal to plus minus uh, J. So plus minus J, one over R square root of C1, C2, which is exactly what we wanted to find. Because, because if, S is supposed to be equal to some j omega as the notch as the notch frequency. You can see that this is our omega. So we found that 
what in, in sinusoidal steady state analysis, when s is equal to j omega, we found what is the omega naught. So uh, omega naught is plus minus 1 over r square root of c1, c2. And if you want to find poles of, uh, let's say, poles of h of s, which means the roots of the second order denominator, so you have to set 1 plus 4 r c1, c2, s plus r squared c1, c2, s squared to 0. And if you do that, uh, you find that, uh, I'm going to write it here. Let's see if I, yes, I have enough space. So I'm going to change the color so that, again, I have better contrast. If you do that, you can rewrite this equation in the form of, of course, uh, just to clean up, in the form of 1 over R2, C1, C2, and then, um, just to make sure I'm not making a mistake, there is no C2 there. Okay, so, um, yes, correct. So plus, um, and then we have 4 over R, C2, S, and uh, then we have S squared equal to 0. So if you set, if you find the roots of this guy, it is effectively S equal to um, minus, so it will be 2 over R, C2, and uh, then 1 plus minus square root of 1 minus c2 over 4c1 if you simplify things. Now, the reason I'm showing you this one is because I'm just trying to highlight one point. Make, let's make the assumption, let's make the assumption, which is very practical assumption, that c1 is the cap that is varying and you can change it to adjust omega naught because you just found that omega naught is a function of r c1 c2 and by keeping r and c2 constant you can just vary c1 and adjust omega naught to whatever value you want. Let's make the assumption that c2 is considerably larger, practically larger than, much larger than 4 c1. If that is the case, then this whole thing uh, gets us to this value. Again, changing the color so that contrast is there for poles. So uh, this is zeros. Now we are talking about poles or subdenominator. For poles, we find they are minus 2 over R, R, C, 2, and then plus minus uh, J, and uh, um, just making sure I'm not missing something, 1 over r square root of c1, c2. So those are the poles. If effectively, for, for with this assumption, with, with the assumption that, let me just highlight that using different color, with the assumption that c4 is reasonably large enough compared to 4c1, we get to this interesting outcome that uh, the poles are actually having the same, roughly practically the same imaginary part as the zeros. And the only real part which is considerably smaller than imaginary part. So what I'm trying to highlight is if you, if you show the uh, S domain and uh, sort of trying to highlight the omega. So here is the omega axis in S domain and uh, this is, let's say, the real axis, then zeros are actually here. So I am going to show you zeros. This is the zero you found. And of course, there is the, um, and of course, there is the uh, counterpart of that on the negative side. This zero is plus, let's say, 1 over r square root of c1, c2 on the j omega axis. And uh, for, for uh, poles, you have the poles like here. Because as I said, the real part of poles is small compared to imaginary part of the pole that is equal to the same imaginary size for the zero. Now, interestingly, you can see that if I start from DC, so the red point means I am at DC. A vector goes like this, which means the size of numerator. A vector goes like this, which means size of denominator. These two vectors are roughly the same, uh, roughly practically, because uh, the real part of pole is a small. So no wonder that at DC, 
the numerator divided by denominator becomes 1, so it means gain of or transfer function of 1, basically v in goes to v out. At super high frequency, so I'm going to extend the y-axis, at super high frequency, you are here, frequency-wise, you are here. Because to get from DC to super high, you just go along the y-axis, omega axis, to get to super high. Same argument applies, because over there, if I fa can find a different color, over there you can say that the vector now goes, uh, goes this way, and the other vector goes this way. So numerator, denominator, again, become same magnitude size, so... Effectively, at super high frequency, you have gain of 1, v, out, v in goes to V out without change. But exactly at the frequency of 0, or root of numerator, output becomes 0, independent of V in. So we just, gener we just really construct a notch filter. This is the uh, analysis of poles and zeros and transfer function. And looking at transfer function, it exactly looks like that. When S, you and you set, uh, so for transfer function... When you set h of s equal to 0, you can see obviously the answer is 1. When you set h of s, when s goes to infinity, because of the fact that both numerator and denominator are second order, you end up with uh, uh, the second, the highest order component in numerator and denominator to remain. And therefore, uh, you can see that it is this component and this component, and they are the same, so you get one as well. So transfer function converges to one for both DC and super high frequency. Again, showing these are all confirming that this is true, meaning that this is the magnitude of transfer function as expected. At DC, gain of one. At super high frequency, gain of one. At omega naught, gain is zero. Okay, so um, this is the analysis of the circuit complete. We found the transfer function. Now, if you're interested in understanding from this point on, I'm, I'm just going to quickly, intuitively say why this circuit is actually, looking even at the circuit drawing, is, is actually a notch filter. When the frequency is DC or frequency of zero, then C1 and C2 are open circuit. If C1 is open circuit, no current can flow through C1. That means no current can go to 2R, so V in will appear at the positive input terminal, and uh, no current goes through 4R, V in appears at the negative input terminal, and because no current can go through the 4R on the feedback loop, then four, uh, V in appears at the output as well. Okay, if we are at super high frequency, C1 and C2 short, so they are short circuit. Now, when C2 is short, it means voltage drop across C2 is forced to be zero. Therefore, voltage drop across R that is parallel with C2 is, is also zero. If the voltage drop across R is zero, it means no current pass through that R, or basically it means I is zero. And therefore, current through C1 is zero. So it means t no current, when I is zero, no current goes through to R, V in again appear at positive input terminal of up amp one, and therefore, again, V in appears at the negative input terminal of op-amp 1, and therefore V in appears at the output. So that's also intuitive understanding of why this circuit is uh, all gain of 1 at super low and super high frequency, and there is just uh, at, in mid-frequency that something is happening. All right, then. So um, I hope that this analysis is interesting and helpful in terms of understanding how a practical notch filter uh, with adjustable notch frequency can be designed using two op-amps.